This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at the Episcopal Church of the Incarnation, Oviedo, Florida, December 22nd, 2013. I want you to remember three words. You won't get there for a little bit, but this is really what I want to talk about. The first is forgiveness. The second is companionship. The third is obedience. Forgiveness, companionship, obedience. Because that's what these lessons are all about. What I want to do is actually spend time in the gospel lesson. The story of Joseph and the angel appearing to Joseph saying, don't divorce your wife. Um, here's the background. First of all, if you read Luke, you get the story of the Annunciation, the angel appearing to Mary. Uh, the reason there's that emphasis in Luke is because Luke, as a Gentile author, is talking about something brand new, which means the inclusion of Gentiles, but also the inclusion of women in the places where that God uses in an extraordinary way. There is a role of women inspired by the Spirit of God whom God uses in Luke like no other gospel. And it's a part of what he lays out, preparing for Pentecost, when I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, not just the man. See? That's Luke. Matthew has a different intention. Matthew is writing to appeal to an audience that's very interested in Jesus as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Lots of Old Testament quotes in the book of Matthew. So he's very interested in Joseph because Joseph is the heir of King David. And a part of the prophecy for Jesus is that he would be out of the line and lineage of David. Right? So the emphasis is on Joseph as that heir. So we have the story of the angel appearing to Joseph. Now, here's what's going on. Joseph and Mary, if we were to use our language, are betrothed. That's different than mere engagement. What happens in a local community in Israel at the time is that when there is a betrothal, there is a public ceremony. The rabbi is there. The two of them face each other. They make vows. Announcements are made. And for that to be broken, you know, you and I can just sort of call off the engagement. For this, for a betrothal to be broken, literally is divorce. And so when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant and he's not the dad, what's he going to do? It says in here that he is, I want to make sure I get the phraseology right, her husband, notice he is called, even though they're not yet married, because of this betrothal, you see, being a righteous man. What does that mean? To a Jewish audience, that means Joseph is faithful to the law. That's what that means. That means he's kind. It just means he's faithful to the law. Well, what does the law say? If you have a betrothed couple and there is adultery, which is what is considered at that point, then what has, should happen? There should, in fact, be a public trial. It's not pretty. And as a result of that public trial, if in this case, Mary, had been found to be guilty of adultery, she could, in fact, if the full letter of the law was enacted, be stoned to death. Remember the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, she should be stoned to death. They are quoting the Levitical law when they say that. And so, Joseph is righteous, meaning he's obedient to the law, but he's also, it says, a man unwilling to expose her to public disgrace. You see, which is what would have happened. Because at the very least, even though public stonings were really at that point no longer happening in the way they used to because of the Roman occupation, and the Romans had laws about things like that, she could in fact be divorced and therefore always marked even though she's a kill, per se, as that woman, an adulterous woman. 
He does not want that to happen. And so what he wants to do is just quietly work it out with the rabbi for her to be divorced. And he'll go on his own way. That's his plan, you see. But what happens? Joseph goes to bed, falls asleep, and bang. God doesn't want this to happen. So what? An angel appears to him. And basically says, do not dare. Don't you dare do this to her. Uh, in fact, I have a job for you. Your job is to marry her, even though she's pregnant. Because I'm the one that, in fact, according to my own plan, have, has caused her to bear a son. And guess what? You even have a responsibility to name him, which was a part of the Jewish responsibility for a husband to name his children. And so I'm giving you the name that I want you to give him. And it is Jesus. Now, if you and I were to say this in Hebrew, we wouldn't say Jesus. We would say what sounds a little like a funny way to pronounce Joshua. Because they are in fact one and the same name. It would be Yeshua. Which means deliverer. A warrior who would come and set the people free. That's the meaning of the term deliverer. And so you are to call his name Jesus, for he will what? Literally deliver, come and fight on their behalf, so that their sins do not master them. In other words, the analogy is that sin is an enemy to be fought against, and he will be the one to come and bring his own might Fight against sin in a way that actually brings freedom and forgiveness. He will deliver them from their sins. In other words, there is no sense in the New Testament whatsoever that when we come to Jesus and ask Him to forgive us, He goes, that's okay. I know we all mess up. Go ahead, you're forgiven. Oh, nothing like that. He hates the fact that sin can master us. And all of us, we're all in this room together, know what it means to be mastered by sin, right? Not your head. No sanctimony here, please. So, what, what the angel is describing is in fact a real need. A real need. So, that's forgiveness. Remember, forgiveness, companionship, obedience. Forgiveness is first because that's where it starts. Because the biblical understanding is that I am mastered by sin. It is bigger than I am. I need someone to come in and literally break its power in my life. It's like a heavy yoke. And he is the one who removes the yoke. He breaks the power of that sin. And as a result, brings us into a place of forgiveness. Doesn't mean we don't ever sin. But what it does mean is that no sin, no sin is stronger than the forgiving power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not one. That's why Paul would say there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The only reason Paul can say that is because the strongest power at work in the life of a believing Christian is the forgiving power of Jesus that breaks the mastery of sin. So, forgiveness. But, guess what? In this, in this story, Jesus actually is given two names. The first is, you will name him Jesus. But then, there is the quote later from the Isaiah reading that we read earlier. And what's that quote? A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him what? Yeah, you can talk about this, okay. They will name him what? Amen. Amen. See, that's different from Jesus, isn't it? And it has a different understanding. Emmanuel means God with us. And notice the difference in the uh, pronoun. You, Joseph, will name him Jesus, but they shall call him Emmanuel. And that's exactly what happened. That when healings began to happen, exorcisms took place, the feeding of the 5,000, all of the miracles that happened in Jesus his name, often the people would rise up, they would rise up and say, 
God has visited his people. See, Emmanuel, God with us. And so it is that when we know the forgiveness of Jesus, notice when I said, I'm using Rene, I hope you don't mind, uh, it's sort of my, uh, it, he, not only does Jesus in a very kind of passive way, go sort of, they're not, they're there, that's all right. No, he breaks the authority of sin. You notice what else I did? I walked away. And it, that never happens. You see, when Jesus comes and brings forgiveness, what breaks the power of that forgiveness is his presence. He sends his presence into us in a way that breaks the authority of that sin. So what are we the recipients of? Not just forgiveness, but the companionship of his presence. So he says with full authority, what? Lo, I am with you when? Always. Always, even to the very end of the ages. So first of all, forgiveness. And the fruit of that forgiveness is his companionship. That there is nothing that separates me, as Paul writes, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm forgiven. Does that mean I'm perfect? Oh, no. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But the fact of the matter is, is that because his power, his mercy, his mighty love, remember, we're talking about a deliverer here, comes and fights on our behalf. The fruit of that is, is that there is nothing in our life that is stronger than the companionship and the forgiveness and the mercy of Jesus. He is there no matter what. No matter what we feel or don't feel, if you've been claimed by Him, if you belong to Him, if you have asked for forgiveness, you're in. He's yours, you're His. And nothing can break that bond. Because nothing is stronger than what Jesus does in our life as Messiah and King. But then you see, there's a third piece to this. It's not just, oh, I'm forgiven, thank God for that, and I know that wherever I am, He will be with me. He will not just in a kind of passive way be my companion. Never, ever think of God as passive, ever. Ever. A passive God allows me to basically live my life any way I darn well want to with no consequences. And he loves you too much for that to happen. <clears throat> he is always actively at work in your life calling you to himself. For what? So that you can receive more forgiveness? No, because you really are forgiven. So that you can experience a greater sense of the companionship of his presence? Well, yeah, sometimes we get into a mess and we don't feel very much. But that doesn't mean that God's not there. It's never more about an increase of his companionship. In fact, all of that thinking is extraordinarily kind of me-centered, what I need in my life to be who I want to be. Believe me, that's, that's the world. We don't talk like that anymore. Instead, it has everything to do with a forgiveness and a companionship that we might be free to, what's the third thing? Obey. Now that's not fun, is it? But that's because you, you've got a funny bad idea about, about what obedience is. See, in, in our me culture, because I want the right to be able to do what I want to do, the whole idea of obeying somebody else feels like bondage. And yet that is exactly a lie from Satan. It has nothing to do with the Christian walk at all. You're buying into a lie if that's what you think obedience is. It's just the opposite. Obedience means I get to get in on mission. The actual joy of being a part of God's service and doing whatever is necessary to allow nothing to get in the way of that. You see, mission is fun. It's extraordinary. Is it sacrificial? Yes. Is it demanding? Yes. And is it taxing? Yes. Would you rather do anything else with your life? Absolutely not. See, that's what Paul is saying in the epistle lesson. He says this. What's going on? Through whom we have received grace and apostleship. For what purpose? To bring about the obedience of faith among all the, all the Gentiles for the sake of his name. In other words, I get to get in on God's mission so that wherever I am, I can be available for him and his purposes. I can 
be a part of the joy of literally making a difference in the life of another person, of seeing lives changed, of giving in a way that demands everything. This is not always what? Easy. But is it worth it? The answer is yes. Every single time. So, if somehow you think of things like forgiveness and the companionship of God's presence is just kind of what I need to emotionally get through the day, you're still at the starting game. All of this is in fact meant to be fuel. Fuel for obedience. For you to be available, for God to use you wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're His, and you are on duty. That could be in a restaurant. That could be at a club. That could be with your friends. That could be at a business meeting. That could be in your neighborhood at a party. I'm available. God, what would you have me do? And everything else about the way you or organize your life is geared toward wherever you are. That kind of on tiptoe availability. God, what are you going to do today? I'm so glad I get to be a part of it. That's a reason. It really is an invitation into an adventure. An adventure that is much, much larger than you getting the strength you need to fulfill out your to-do list. If that's your understanding of what it means to be a Christian, I'm sorry, actually. That's a very sad, truncated, and inaccurate view of what it means to be a Christian. It just is. And yet that's where many of us are. So understand, we're holding up Joseph here as a model, in fact, of faithful obedience, willing to really step way out of the ordinary, do something that literally ran contrary <laughs> to his own religious training. I mean, this righteous man should have reported her to the rabbi immediately. And he did not. God broke in and in essence was saying, things are new now. <laughs> and it starts with the birth of your son, whom you are to take in even though you're not the real dad, call him Jesus and make a home for him. And that's what we commemorate today. Now, we're about to go into confirmation. We have all this great group of people here with name tags and they're going to be confirmed. What is what we have to do say anything about confirmation? It's exactly that. If you, in the sense that, if you read the liturgy, everything that we're talking about in terms of being on mission, being available for God, that's the essence of what confirmation means. It means I'm willing to be on duty, no matter what. I'm his, and I will belong to him. And notice, you all will make a common commitment of that as well, because believe me, to be a group of people on mission means you need each other's support. You can't sort of do this off on your own somehow. You need their prayers. You need to rest people to wrestle with. Here's what I'm going through. How do I think about this? Whether it's an issue in your business or something going on in your personal life, in your family, I mean, there's a lot in here. This is mostly the Bible. And so how do I work this out? So we need each other. So you make a commitment too. So three things. Forgiveness. Companionship. Obedience. That we might, wherever we are, always be His. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that whatever we've gone through, wherever we are, how well or not we've done the things that we know that we should do, there's room in your presence for us, just as we are. But I thank you, God, that you don't want to merely leave us as we are. You want to pour into us all that is necessary, that wherever we are, we might be your servant ready, able, and willing to serve you. And so we yield to you and ask that you would do whatever is necessary to make that happen. That we might know the joy and the adventure of being your obedient servants. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen.